very sweet, Katrina. Karina. Thank you so much for coming. Can you all hear me okay? And you will be able to understand my accent by the time I'm finished. <laughs> so my name is Manoj. Thank you so much for coming. Who listened to my talk last year? Okay, very good. And uh, who knows virtually nothing about these deities? Okay, good. My goal is to give you a better understanding by the time we're done. And who knows somewhat more? Excellent. The Jiva Mukti is in the front, yeah? And who knows everything? <laughs> I'm also on the path. So uh, that's really the, the goal here is to, to find that one thing. And when you know that, you know everything. And there's a famous story about Ganesha and his brother Murugan, who tries to go around the world and tries to know everything. But I'm not going to tell that in the interest of time. Because when I speak, I speak for 16 hours, and I only have one hour here. So buckle up. I'm going to give you a Reader's Digest version of the whole thing. Okay? So when you look at these statues or deities, uh, murtis, at first sight, they appear polytheism. You know, there are different deities. And that is true in the Hindu tradition. But when you go deeper in the philosophy, it's actually monism, one spirit, that is the foundation for all of these deities. So these are all different manifestations of that one spirit. For instance, Lakshmi on the left. Left is the corner for abundance, feng shui corner. So Lakshmi brings you abundance. Ganesh brings you uh, wisdom, removes obstacles. Saraswati brings you knowledge, etc. These are different aspects of the one spirit. And it's who we are. So you go from polytheism to monism. But when you go even deeper, it's actually non-dualism. It's what is called Advaita, non-duality. And that's the pinnacle of Indian philosophy. It is the eternal subject. It's the I am. And you cannot talk about it. It's not that. You cannot think about it. It's not that. So, how do you realize you are the self without objectifying it? That's where these deities have come about. When you truly understand the stories and the symbols, they actually help you wherever you are in your life and then they lead you to self-realization or enlightenment. The easiest way to understand them is as archetypes. And the word archetype was coined by the Swiss psychologist Carl Jung. Who's familiar with Carl Jung? Good. So Jung was profoundly influenced by these deities. He said, these reside within what he called the collective unconscious. In other words, within all of us. But this Sanskrit word is more powerful. It's called Ishta Devata. Ishta means desired. Devata means deity. It's more heart-centered. I feel archetype is more intellectual. And the, fa the way you find your archetype is... It's like falling in love. You have to gravitate towards a statue. You don't know why, but that's your archetype. And you may have archetypes from different traditions. The cross is a beautiful archetype. Uh, take, for instance, the sun god. In Egypt, we were in Luxor many years ago, before all the craziness started. The sun god is called Ra, Amun Ra. The same sun god in the Roman tradition is Mitra. And the same sun god in the yogic tradition is Surya. So the names are similar even though the archetypes are thousands of years and thousands of miles apart because these are universal archetypes. They belong to all of us. However, these yogi Surya existed over hundreds of years. Whereas very few people work with Egyptian or Isis, Athena. That's because the entire philosophy of yoga is encapsulated in all these symbols. And that's what I'm going to talk about. And interestingly, as a, as a detour, the Roman god of the sun, Mitra, and yesterday was the longest day of the year, the sun was at the zenith here. But Mitra was born 600 BC, and he was born of a virgin mother. And he was born on 25th December, and he was a wandering priest and he had 12 disciples and when he died he was resurrected three days later 
Sounds familiar. That's the son of God, son God, yeah? So these are universal archetypes, okay? So without further ado, let me expose you to the fiercest archetype on this table. That's, who's, who's this lady? Durga. And please, if you have any questions, ask away. I'm here to serve you. I want to feel emptied by the time I leave. Yeah? It's really about you. It's not about me. It's really how much you understand. And Durga, for people who know Durga, she's like Kali light. Yeah? So when you see Durga, a murti of Durga, you have many features. You see a beautiful woman on a fierce lion with all these weapons. And uh, what's it about? So there's always a story and a philosophy. The story is there was this demon called Mahishasura. Mahish means buffalo. Asura means he had demonic tendencies. Sura is light. Asura means away from the light. And this demon also did yoga. And the demon would meditate on Lord Shiva and he would chant Om Namah Shivaya, Om Namah Shivaya, Om Namah Shivaya. And he would stand on one leg and do a tree pose and he would do it for like 10 years. And you see these sadhus doing it in India, they would do this. And the idea is in yoga, there's a concept called tapas. You build a friction or heat. And when you do that, enormous insights can be attained. So this demon did that and Shiva gets pleased. That's the reason they do that. Shiva gets easily pleased. And that's Shiva, or the, the dancing Shiva. So Shiva comes up to the demon and asks, what do you want? The demon said, I want immortality. Shiva said, nobody gets true immortality. I'll give you the next best thing. No existing god or goddess or human can kill you. And the demon said, okay, I'll take it. So he gets this, you know, siddhis or powers. And this boon Shiva gives to the demon is like your intention coming true. You heard of like Dr. Emoto's water experiments, right, in Japan, where he found the quality of your mind can affect the water crystals. So if your mind is disordered, the water crystals are disordered. If your mind is sattvic, the crystals are nicely ordered. It's called smectic or isotropic states. That was my PhD thesis in Cornell, yeah? Liquid crystal phase transitions. So this demon gets this boon and he took it and instead of going further down the yogic path, he gets the siddhis and Patanjali in his sutras warns against it. You can get these powers doing yoga. I remember seeing many years ago a, a yogi meditating in the Himalayas and he was naked and he's like sweating in the snow because we have these powers within us. And this demon starts to torture a lot of people and people try to kill him, nobody could kill him. All the gods and goddesses couldn't kill him. He had this boon. So people go to Lord Shiva and say, hey, what have you done? You know, you've created a Frankenstein, save us. Shiva said, I'm too busy meditating on Mount Kailash. Don't bother me, you know. So he said, go bother my wife. So they all run to Shakti or Parvati, Shiva's wife. <clears throat> Excuse me. So Shakti said, okay, I'll help you. So she stood in one spot and asked all the gods and goddesses to give their powers to her. So each of them gave their Shakti, their power to Parvati or Shiva's wife. So for instance, Kali gives the axe, Vishnu gives the chakra, the wheel of samsara and the conch shell, Lakshmi gives the beautiful lotus, Ram gives the bow, Hanuman gives the mace, Shiva himself gives the trishula, the trident, and the beautiful face was given by Parvati, Sundari. And this incredibly beautiful woman, now who's new, so she's not an existing god or goddess, remember that boon. So she's a new entity and she comes riding on this lion, a fierce lion, bobbing up and down towards the demon. And you can almost hear Krishna Das singing, Jai Ma Durga. Yeah? <laughs> and the demon takes one look at her and he falls in love. Says, he says, come, marry me, we will torture the world together. Yeah? <laughs> but she wouldn't have it and she mer mercifully 
compassionately slays him. Yeah? So that's the story. The philosophy is we have these demons within us. It's called samskaras, right? Those addictive patterns. And, you know, the older you get, the more these patterns are entrenched. In other words, you don't smoke the cigarette, the cigarette smokes you. And you see all walks of life, people doing, celebrities doing stupid things, politicians, yoga teachers, they're not accepted. Uh, alcoholics, they would say, we are powerless against the source because these samskaras, they control you. And how is that? The, your ego resides in your mind, the subtle aspect of the mind. In other words, you have three bodies, the physical body, the subtle body, the mind, you can't see the mind, that's where the ego resides and your causal body, which you go to in deep sleep. And these addictive patterns are residing right there, the samskaras in your causal body. And they control the ego, the subtle body. It's like the flashlight and the battery. The flashlight is the ego, the battery are the samskaras, and you, the ego tries to look for the samskaras. No, it's controlled by them. Now Durga, as your archetype, guess where she resides? She resides in your causal body. That's what Carl Jung called the collective unconscious. That's how she's able to slay these demons within us. So Durga is like goodness in a fierce form, the fierce form of the Divine Mother. So let's say Durga is your archetype. So if there's an amalgamation of all the gods and goddesses in one deity, it is Durga. There are four practices you can do with your archetype. And with, that's true with any archetype. Number one, you create an altar, beautiful altar, put some flowers, candles, and every day you just meditate a few minutes, doesn't have to be long. Or it can be longer. When you meditate, you know, people focus on the thoughts, stilling the mind. And that's the entire premise of Patanjali Yoga, Yoga Chitta Vritta Nirodha cessation of fluctuations of the mind. It takes a lifetime, if not more. Instead of your thoughts, you focus on the gap or the space between your thoughts. Because the space between your thoughts is pure consciousness. In other words, your thoughts are overlaid on consciousness. So when you meditate and thoughts recede in your mind, your mind is suffused with pure consciousness. It's like a vacuum. At that moment, you open your eyes to Ma Durga. Your mind sucks in all the energy she represents and you awaken the archetype of Durga within you. It's a simple but powerful technique. I actually learned this from Dr. Deepak Chopra. I, I used to teach at his retreats 10 years ago in San Diego, that's where I live. And Deepak shared with me the talks he gives, the books he writes. He was an endocrinologist by training and he transformed because he's been meditating in front of his archetypes, Krishna and Ganesh, for 30 years. So what you're doing is channelizing these highest energies through you. Okay, it's a very powerful technique. Besides this one technique, there are three other ways to work with any archetype in your day-to-day -day life. And I can tell you later if there's time. Okay? Any questions on Durga? Now, Let me talk about Shiva. So when Shiva dances, he's called Nataraj, the dancing Shiva. And the dancing Shiva is perhaps the most recognized art from India. There's a symbol of Indian art in yoga, it's the dancing Shiva. So it is the archetype of anyone in radical change in their life. Be it a new spiritual path, a new business, a new relationship, a new yoga studio, anything radically new. So the circle with flames represent flames of creation. We're creating our own universe. Any experience you have in your life right now is something you've created from the past. It's karma. Not only past this life, it's karma from the past life. So, anything you encounter, 
right now in your life, including this conversation we're having, it's a choiceless situation, okay? Something has impelled you to sit down here, okay? Or anything you face, good or bad, is karma. Now you would think it's all destiny. No, we have free will. And the free will is how we react to that situation. We have the choice. So we can react in a dharmic way or an adharmic way, okay? And that free will is shown by the flame Shiva holds in one hand. That is likened to the fire in your belly. You need to transform. You're getting out of your comfort zone. You're, most people are like stuck in a rut in life. They are like comfortably numb. They are unable to change. This is the flame Shiva holds. He encourages us to change all the time. See, the real challenge in life is how to seek the unfamiliar in the familiar. Most people want new jobs, new relationships, new cities to move to, new, new, new. The real challenge is how do you seek the jaw, the vivra in your existing relationships, in your existing walk to work, in your existing job. It's that sense of wonder. As kids have that, it's called adbhuta in Sanskrit. As adults, we lose it. So that archetype is also Shiva. So the flame represents the fire in your belly you need to transform. And that's his hair on each side. That's like jada, dreads. So if you dance ecstatically, the hair goes to either side and you become the dancing Shiva. And that's, on the other hand, is a drum, the damaru, which is the pulse beat of transformation. Everything is vibratory in this universe with the energy of Shiva. There was a 10th century Sans Sanskrit text called Spanda Karika, the theory of vibrations, which talks about the universe as vibratory coming from Shiva. And that's something the physicists found out last century, that everything is vibrating. Even this inner table is vibrating. So this part of Shiva represents creation. But when you embark on change, the old thoughts and old relationships, they drag you down. And that's represented by this being of forgetfulness at the bottom. So it is really the old patterns in your own thinking, the old maybe relationships who can't handle your change. You know, the old ways of doing things were caught in the same thing. And this entity is called Apasmara. Smara in Sanskrit means to remember, like Bhagavad Gita is a smriti, a remembered text. Apasmara means you literally forget. You become paralyzed, unable to change. You become like a deer caught in the headlights right here. And most people are like this their whole life. They are like comfortably numb. So what Shiva does in this statue, he steps on his butt, he crushes it, and he teaches us life is about creation and destruction simultaneously. You have to push out the old to bring in the new. That is true, correct? However, during conscious change, we worry about the results. And it's very natural, it's a human tendency, it comes from our ego. Our ego doesn't live in the now, it thinks of the past mistakes we made, or it projects in the future, and says, what if the results of a transformation doesn't work out? For that, Lord Shiva does two things. Number one, he raises his left foot. This is called Anugraha, the foot of upturned grace. And with his left hand, he makes a grand sweeping gesture to his feet, right here. The hands gesturing to his feet, he's saying is, let it go, surrender. The word surrender, you know, you talk to a guy on the street, he would say it's like giving up. But from a yogi's perspective, surrender is like a drop of water merging with the ocean. You gain the infinite. In fact, you realize you are the infinite. So if you view your life at every step as surrender, what Shiva does is with the other hand he does this. This is the Abhaya Mudra. Bhaya means fear, Abhaya means he removes all fears and uncertainties within you. Life is inherently uncertain. Anything can happen anytime. But Shiva says at every moment, if you create, destroy and use the results of your action as an occasion to surrender, 
Life is amazing, okay? You become fearless. So that's what Lord Krishna says in the Gita. You have a right to the action. You do not have a right to the results of the action, okay? But it's always, the path of yoga is always a combination of effort and grace. We do the yoga meditation chanting to surrender and then grace pours in. The example I like to give is, you know, my wife and I, we travel all over the country. We teach workshops. And when we teach, we take these murtis, these statues with us. We were even in Hong Kong three weeks ago at the Asia Yoga Conference. There were like 3,000 yogis. We taught six workshops there. And, uh, you know, when you take this by plane, uh, you're only allowed so much, yeah? And these are really heavy. So you're allowed like 50 pounds a bag, two bags per person, not much. But what they don't measure is your handbag, yeah? So my carry-on is like I put as many murtis as I can. <laughs> and that now weighs about 80 pounds. And I have to schlep it onto the plane. Schlepping is a Sanskrit word, yeah? <laughs> and then the stewardess is watching me when I'm bringing it on the plane. And she's looking at me suspiciously because I'm like trying to lift it and it's really heavy. That's effort, right? That's a path of yoga, effort. And grace is making me smile <laughs> as if it's not too heavy, yeah? So that's the path of effort and grace. So now most people live on the edge of the circle, which is creation, destruction, creation, destruction. We're like buffeted by waves of change. Even by the time you're listening to me, thousands of cells in your body have died, thousands have been created. But when you take a spinning wheel, the wheel of samsara of our lives, something is changeless in a spinning circle or a spinning wheel. What's the one thing that doesn't change? The center. And where is the center? Right where the heart is. Thank you, Austin. You should get a Rudra, that's your name. I should call you Rudra. Rudra Austin. The heart is a very beautifully designed statue. The heart is right in the center. The heart is a seat of pure consciousness. That's where the I am resides. The Upanishads say, consciousness is the size of a thumb smack in the center of your heart. That's where the I am resides. So, Shiva says, life is a dance. You create, you destroy, but know who you are, pure consciousness. There's a impermanent, impermanency in life, along with a permanent joy within you, okay? That's the key here, to realize the self while you're engaged with the world. Now, interestingly, when he shows you the way which is surrender at every point, he crosses his heart. The crossing of the heart represents the deepest, darkest moments in our life. It's the proverbial dark night of the soul. It's actually an op opportunity to surrender. That's why Lord Krishna taught Arjuna the Bhagavad Gita when he was at his most despondent. You can ask, why didn't Yudhishthira, the elder brother, get the teachings? That's because Arjuna was ready. Yudhishthira was comfortable with the spirituality. Arjuna he was like a proverbial frog in, thrown in boiling water. You had this um, intense crisis. It's an opportunity to go deeper on the spiritual path. That's the, that's the teaching of here. So when you chant the mantra, Om Namah Shivaya, the word Shiva also means the divinity or consciousness everywhere. God's everywhere. The Upanishads say the metaphor is like a spider spinning its web from itself. That's the meaning of Shiva. Shiva means the divine or consciousness everywhere. So when you chant Om Namah Shivaya, God is not in this tradition a localized entity like a bearded old white dude in the heavens, sometimes with an anger management problem, yeah? <laughs> God is everywhere. So you would chant Om Namah Shivaya, you're doing Namaste, Nama to the Shiva everywhere. The highest Vedantic meaning is Nama, not me. I am Shiva. Finally, there's no difference between you and the dancer. It's a duet of one. Okay. Now, a question can be asked, Who's been to India in this group? Okay, excellent. So when you go to India, the Indians will not say they are archetypes, correct? 
what will the Indians say? They are real. And I grew up in Mumbai. I uh, studied engineering. I came here. I became a scientist. I have a PhD from Cornell in chemical physics. So I, will, I was all here. But I grew up in Mumbai with the stories about these deities. And here I come, I was influenced by Deepak, and you know, I said, I got into doing this, and Deepak said they are archetypes. And it was nice, it was interesting. But always I had that conflict, are they real or are they archetypes? And I had heard about these scrolls, which really come from Shiva and Shakti and was written by Ganesh. So let's back up. Let's go 5,000 years before today. A conversation between Shiva and his wife Shakti. And the conversation was about everyone's lives in the universe. So Shakti would ask Shiva questions and Shiva would respond. For instance, Shakti would ask Shiva, when did Manoj meet Sid and his beautiful fiancé? And uh, Shiva would reply, the first day of Wanderlust, and they just connected and Sid got a beautiful big Ganesh from Manoj. And his fiancé got a beautiful Kali, Shiva's wife, and Ganesh's mom, right? And this conversation was recorded by Ganesh. He is the god of riders. And it was really about everyone's life. So when Shakti would ask Shiva questions in Tantra, it's called Agama. When Shiva would ask Shakti questions, it's called Negama. And it was, everything was recorded, past, present, and future. And Ganesh revealed this to seven enlightened sages. And in that stage of enlightenment, there's no time, no space. So it's like a painting, you know, you go near the painting, you see a little bit. You go further away, you get a bigger picture. So in physics, it's called the observer effect. The act of observing determines what is being observed. Depends on the position of the observer. So these scrolls were written on palm leaves by these sages. And they had passed down generation to generation, coming from 5,000 years ago. And right now it's in the hands of a few families in this little village in Tamil Nadu called Vaitisvaran Koel near Chidambaram. That's a Shiva temple in the world, Nataraj temple. And they call called Nadi scrolls, N-A-D-I. And I'd heard about these scrolls, uh, but I wasn't sure if they were right or wrong, or if it were really, you know, correct. And uh, to me, you know, the scrolls uh, also said that these are real, right? These scrolls came from Shiva, Shakti, and Ganesh. So there was a part on, in me which is like a healthy skeptic. You know, I still, I still am. So on my next pilgrimage to India, this was about nine years ago, I was visiting temples in South India. And I was in a big like uh, pilgrimage kick, you know. I would visit like 40 temples in one month. And when you visit these small temples in different villages, you know, you would rent a car. And when you rent a car in India, it comes with a driver because you don't want to drive, it's crazy, yeah. There are no lanes, you share the road with cows, bullocks, all kinds of other beings, and you have to make your own lane, you know. So the driver is driving me from temple to temple, I'm like under jet lag, I'm taking naps. Suddenly I see a fork in the road which said, Vaitis for coil. And I wasn't planning to go there, but it was the back of my mind, and I remembered. I told the driver, go for it. And we end up in this little village. And we end up late night, and I went to the Nadi Center and I scoped it out. And we go to a hotel to stay, and there's only one hotel in town, that's how small that village is. And next day, early morning, bright and early, I go there, and they take my right, right thumbprint. And for women, it's the left thumbprint. And based on your thumbprint, there are 108 different possibilities your life can take. It's karma. So the guy said, okay, I'm going to go in the back, there's a warehouse, and I'm going to come back with some scrolls, which will tell you about your life. But we have to identify the right scroll.
I said, okay. So he goes in the back, takes a long time, because everything takes a long time in India. <laughs> Comes back with a bundle, solemnly unwraps the bundle, and he chants a mantra, Om, Trayambakam, Yajamahe, etc. And he opens a scroll. He said, this is saying your name is Prakash. And he said, this will ask you questions. All you have to do is answer yes or no, but don't volunteer any information. So I said, no. And he tossed the scroll. Brings out another scroll. He said, you were born 10th June 1950. I said, no. Another scroll. You have two sisters. I said, no. Another scroll. Your mother's name is Preeti. No. So seemingly like random questions. Even about what I you know, do as an occupation, it said, one of the questions was, uh, are you, you are a doctor. I said, no, I'm a PhD, a poor and hungry doctor. Yeah? An MD is a money doctor. <laughs> and then it kept going on and on, and the bundle would get over, and it'd go in the back, take a long time, come back, and the questions would resume. And it kept going on and on for like two or three hours, and it's hot. It's South India, there's only a fan, I'm getting uncomfortable. And I also felt he was asking me too many questions, you know, it's like that game 2020. Yeah. You ask somebody enough questions, you know. It's like that famous scene in that movie, Inglorious Bastards, right? In that bar, <laughs> where they have that playing cards with their celebrity names. You ask questions, you can find out who that person is. So I was like beginning to give up. All of a sudden, a scroll popped up. It said, your name is Manoj Chalam. That was right on. But I thought they got it from the hotel I stayed in, yeah? <laughs> Indians are very smart. But then the next question said, you were born 12th May 1962. And no way anyone had that information. So I start to get like chills and goosebumps. Then it said, my mother's name is Raja Lakshmi, correct? It said, my father's name is Venkatachalam. Correct. It said, uh, my wife's name means someone that means light. And for people who know my wife, her name is Jyoti. Her, Jyoti means light in Sanskrit. It said, my daughter's age. At that time, she was 10. Now she's 19, a fr just finished her freshman year at Amherst College. Yeah? We didn't tell her name, but it told me her age. And then it said, uh, I live overseas and I import art of a spiritual nature. And that like floored me because it also told me it is time sensitive. This was nine years ago. Before that, a few years before that, I wasn't doing this. I was in high tech. I was a CEO of a software company and I got fired. That's the best thing that happened to me. My main man, Ganesh, whacked me on the head. Yeah. And it said, Ganesh is my archetype, my Ishta Devata. And that's true, I've always felt a connection with Ganesh. Probably because of my belly also, yeah? <laughs> and then uh, it said, uh, I started to teach recently, which I did about 10 years ago. And uh, it said, I help find people their archetypes, the Ishta Devatas. And that's true, you know, that's, we travel all over the country and when I look at people, I just sometimes, I know what the archetype is. You had that yesterday. I, I looked at you and I just knew. It just comes sometimes and that's my dharma. That's what I'm born to do. We're all born to do something. That's why I don't have a website. In North America, I probably have the largest collection of these deities. I have a big warehouse in San Diego with a temple. Don't know website for 13 years because it's important you have to see them. It's like falling in love, you know. You don't fall in love with a picture. You have to see the person and engage. And then it said, uh, it stepped forward in my life every three years and said, those scrolls said whatever has already happened. So it said how my teachings would progress. It said my wife and I would start to teach. Yes, we've been teaching a lot together since our daughter went to college. It said we'll build a temple and, you know, uh, four years ago we actually moved our warehouse in San Diego and we built a temple inside and Jyoti said, hey, isn't that what the scroll said? It said things like don't drive late night and health issues that might crop up 
Every, every three years kept going forward and forward. Finally, the guy said, this scroll is giving me the time of your death. Do you want to know? I said, yeah. I, you know, I'm like rocking and rolling. I want to know everything. <laughs> so it gave, it gave me the time I'm going to pass away. It's in the month of April, the third week, and it's comfortably far away. I was like amazed. I was like flabbergasted. I felt like going out and standing in front of a truck, seeing what's going to happen. <laughs> yeah? <laughs> because you read in the spiritual yogic literature, you're not your body. At that time, I knew. I knew there's a deep spirit within us. I also knew that these deities are real. They're not just mere archetypes. Because these scrolls came from Shiva, Shakti, Ganesha. And I said, hey man, it's time to go Time to be serious of the spiritual path. It's not just intellectual. There's a deep knowing here, okay? And uh, I had my last beer nine years ago. I stopped eating meat. I committed myself deeper on the path. And I, the only reason I'm sharing this experience is for people, you know, there's a lot of healthy skeptics out there, including me. But these are not just mythology. They're re as real as you and me, okay? Any questions so far? So it doesn't matter what nationality you are. American, German, French people have gotten their names with their French names. Uh, one question can be asked, six and a, since there are six and a half billion on the planet, are there six and a half billion scrolls? Because that warehouse seemed pretty small in the back. No, it's only those people who are destined to go there. So the fact you're listening to me, Austin, might mean you might go and get your scroll one day. It knows when you're coming, it's a feedback loop. Now here's an unusual statue. When Shiva dances as Nataraj, he's called Ananda Tandava, the dance of joy. Tandava means dance. There are 108 poses in the dance, and the number 108 is an amazing significance. But I may not have time to go into it. That's the last pose. I have the whole family to cover here, so bear with me. We're going to buckle up, yeah? This is called Moksha Tandava. It's very rare. Moksha means ultimate freedom. So it's a dance of liberation, Jiva Mukta. And the freedom, it says, is no need to die and go to heaven. Heaven is right here as we speak. And that true freedom comes from the flame Shiva holds. That's the fire of jnana, the fire of illuminative wisdom. It burns a thousand lifetimes of avidya, ignorance. The Latin word video to see comes from vidya, knowledge. Avidya means you're ignorant of your true nature. So it's like a thousand years of darkness is dispelled by a single source of light because the darkness was never there. It's been an absence of light. Light and darkness can never coexist. So only true knowledge, jnana, can liberate you. Bhakti, yoga, meditation is all fantastic. The final step is Advaita Vedanta, non-duality, okay? But not everyone's ready for that. When we teach non-duality workshops, it's not only the funnel is narrow, it's more an espresso drip for the people who come to me, yeah? When I teach mythology, I get a wide turnout. But you can teach the same philosophy through the mythology, okay? So true freedom comes from knowledge. And the hands going back represents ultimate freedom. The Damaru drum means time and space comes from within you. And a spontaneous alchemy of transformation happens where the legs go up and the hands going down, right? But as opposed to doing a handstand in yoga where the hands and leg muscles are contorted with stress, look at the hand, it's bent. Look at the legs, it's like gracefully, it's free, it's flying. Because upon enlightenment, the sense of doership vanishes. That I am doing karma, I am doing actions, which, bore, which bear results, which bear fruits of the action. Nobody is really doing anything, we are pretending we are doing stuff, it's all grace. What's up and what's down, somebody looking at us from outer space thinks we are upside down. There is no up, no down, no north, no south, everything is Shiva. 
Now, even Apasmara, the figure at the bottom has flipped. What that represents is the old karmas, which have to play out. It's called Prarabdha Karma. It's like a fan being switched off. The moment it's switched off, you lose your sense of doership. That's enlightenment. But the fan still takes a while coming to a stop. So that's the old karmas playing out. We come into the world with a backpack of this Prarabdha Karma. It has to exhaust. That's why even the greatest sage of the last century, Ramana Marshi, he had throat cancer after enlightenment. So one still has to do spiritual practice, yoga, meditation, chanting, to maintain that. That's what this figure at the bottom represents. So it's like the Zen saying, you know, before enlightenment one chops wood, carries water. After enlightenment one chops wood, carries water. The great sages know, on the surface they act like anyone else, Underneath they know that nobody is doing anything, okay? So all the spiritual traditions in yoga come to this state. In Buddhism it's called Nirvana. In yoga it's called Moksha Tandava, the dance of ultimate freedom, okay? <clears throat> Let me talk about Ganesh. So Ganesh is considered the remover of obstacles, perhaps the most popular deity in America. You see, Ganesh is everywhere now, yeah? In France, they have a Ganesh museum. In Thailand, Chiang Mai, they have a Ganesh museum. I, you know, somebody from Ireland told me in Belfast, there's a big park of 20-foot Ganesh statues. There's even a Ganesh drinking a Guinness, yeah? <laughs> so Ganesh can do everything, yeah? And he's considered also the remover of obstacles. So anything new you do, a new job, a new day, a new wedding, birthday, especially a business, a new yoga teacher training, Ganesh removes obstacles. The question is, how does he remove obstacles? So if you notice, every Ganesh has a mouse. That's, that's a big mouse, yeah? It's a super-sized American rat right there, yeah? So the mouse is his vehicle. So this big elephant dude rides on this little mouse. But symbolically, the mouse represents your mind. Because your minds wander, like the way the mouse campers. So when Ganesh rides on the mouse, he calms your wavering mind. And in your life, there have been instances where you're in a zone, things flow, you don't sense obstacles. So the real obstacles you sense are not outside, they're within you, as vrittis or fluctuations of the mind. That's the secret, how he removes obstacles. He gets in, into a state of what is called practicing samadhi, where your thought patterns are uniform. He doesn't like freak you out. Some people like get freaked out by an earliest obstacle, no. He stabilizes you. That's the secret of Ganesh. Once obstacles are removed, what most people don't know is Ganesh actually leads you to self-realization, enlightenment. And that's shown in these, okay? This is a suite of enlightenment. His trunk is curved, it's Vakratunda, and it points to that. And the suite represents the suite of enlightenment, Satchitananda. Sat is truth of what is pure consciousness. Chit is awareness, ananda is bliss. So when you're aware of your true nature, that you are pure consciousness, you're in bliss. This is the broken tusk he holds because he wrote the Mahabharata from where the Gita came. And the deal was he should write it uninterruptedly. So when the ink ran out, he broke his tusk and wrote it. So it symbolizes self-sacrifice. For a noble task, it symbolizes don't procrastinate. Yeah? But there's a deeper significance. How do you know it's a broken tusk? Because he has one left. Yeah? It denotes the oneness of consciousness when you break the illusion of Maya. I'll give you an example. You spend a lot of money building a beautiful window for this room, but when you shatter the window, what's left is the oneness of space. We don't say inside space and outside. It's one. Similarly, when you shatter the illusion of the broken tusk, what's left is a oneness. I taught a three-day workshop just on the broken tusk. The entire field of Advaita Vedanta comes from that. Yeah? Then he holds an axe. 
the axe, it chops the pull of this world on your ego. The philosophy of Vedanta teaches you that your ego, it straddles the line between this world of multiplicity and pure non-dual consciousness. In other words, when I look at you, I'm seeing your body in time and space, but the real you is beyond time and space and your ego is like a knot smack in the center of your heart. And the ego actually resides in the heart when you're in deep sleep. And when you wake up in the morning and you're very discerning, the sense of I, the individuality goes from here to the back of your head. That's where we feel like ego, ego resides. But it stays here. Another acronym for ego is edging Ganesh out. Yeah? So the ego gets sucked into the world through the five senses. It gets enmeshed. Sometimes too much if you visit Vegas, right? Too much sensory overload. So the axe of Ganesh, right here, he holds in his right hand, he chops that pull. Then on the other hand, he holds a noose, a lasso. He pulls your ego back into where it belongs, pure consciousness. So awakening or enlightenment happens to your ego. There are spiritual traditions which tell you, hey, be egoless. That's silly. We need our ego so we can drive and be functional. But we know who we are. We, we are pure consciousness. So interestingly, the Sanskrit word for ego is ahamkara. I, maker. Aham. And the Sanskrit word for the vastness of consciousness is maha. Right? The vastness, great. So when Ganesh chops the pull, and he flips the ego back. What happens when you flip back aham, A-H-A-M? What do you get? A-H-A-M, maha. He makes your individual the maha. That's why he has an elephant head on a human body. The elephant head is maha, the human body is us. So Ganesh represents the great Mahavakya and the Vedas, Tattva Masi, very powerful, okay? So there are deep hidden symbols behind all these deities and stories. Now I remember an incident about six years ago. I was at a yoga journal conference in Wisconsin and an elderly gentleman walks up to me. He was in his late 60s. And he was very drawn, you know, he wanted to buy a Ganesh for his wife who just finished her yoga teacher training and he wanted to gift a Ganesh usually. That's very appropriate for somebody who finishes the training. It's like a new threshold because Ganesh is a threshold deity. Just like in the story, he guards this cave of his mom, Shakti, taking a bath at the threshold. Similarly, resides within us the threshold of the Muladhara. He arouses the Kundalini Shakti within us. So these metaphors you have to take into your, into your life. So, I explained to him all the symbols of Ganesh and I told him how to practice, meditate in front of him. He said, all this is fine, but I don't believe you, he said. I'm an atheist. I said, hey, I, I thought inside even atheism itself is a belief of no belief, but I didn't want to argue, right? <laughs> so I said, fine, but he still wanted to buy a Ganesh. So he bought a big Ganesh, it was a green standing Ganesh. Dr. David Frawley calls him the militant Ganesh. He has the same Ganesh. And he walks out with his Ganesh. And in five minutes, he, he comes running back. He said he and his wife won a drawing for a cruise to the Bahamas. And that was worth like three, several thousand dollars. And they've never won anything like this. Just that very moment it happened. So the whole day, he wouldn't let go of Ganesh. <laughs> yeah, he was so amazed and happy. And that seems to have like converted him. And now he becomes a yoga teacher. He teaches meditation, mantras. He buys a big <laughs> Shiva from me. So sometimes it takes a little experience, you know. I just was in Brooklyn in April and I taught a 500 hour teacher training. A woman bought another sitting Ganesh from me. She was from Germany, but she lives in New York doing the teacher training. And she just sent me an email. She said she's been waiting for a green card for eight years. And she asked me to share with everyone that just when she took the Ganesh home, she got the green card in the mail. It's like, you know, these inexplicable things happen when, when Ganesh is around. And you just surrender to the amazing synchronicities, okay? All I'm saying is Ganesh is the, is the main man here, okay? <laughs> Any questions so far? Yes, sir. Sid. 
Say that again. Very good. Thank you. Uh, it's called Vakratunda. So the great mantra is Vakratunda Mahakaya Surya Koti Samaprabha Nirvignam Kurme Deva Sarvakari Shu Sarvada. Vakratunda is a twisted trunk. And if you notice, every Ganesha's trunk is twisted. Always, every statue. And if elephant's trunk hangs down. And that's the path of least resistance. It's the new age path which says you're already enlightened, you don't know it. The twisted trunk means do sadhana, spiritual practice, yoga, meditation, chanting, okay? And then you get the sweet of enlightenment. That's why the twisted trunk always points to the sweet of enlightenment. He wants us to taste it. Okay, excellent, thank you. Let me talk about <clears throat> goddesses. Who's this one? Lakshmi. So Lakshmi is the goddess of abundance, prosperity and beauty and this quality called Shri, luminosity. And the feng shui corner for abundance is always on the left. That's why I put her on the left. So when you look at her iconography, she has two lotuses on each hand. And the lotus is like a beautiful symbol of uh, beauty because a lotus can grow in mud or a dirty pond, but it's beautiful. So she says there's a lotus within you. You can be anywhere, but you can bloom out doing yoga. A lotus is also niralambhaya, it's untainted. Okay, you drop water on a lotus, it just coalesces into a drop, it just comes right off. So everything just, nothing sticks to you, you're pure. With the one hand, she gives you abundance. That's the left hand. That's called the Varada Mudra, the boon giving hand. And the abundance she gives you is material prosperity. She actually wants you to make a lot of money so you can help people. Money is no good stagnant and just hoarding money. It has to keep flowing. That's true Lakshmi. You have an aspect of Lakshmi to Rudra. Yeah? That's true abundance is she makes you spiritually abundant. You become so abundant, it's like your left hand never gets jealous of your right hand. We're part of one entity. She makes you so expansive, your community becomes your family. That's the true meaning of Lakshmi. That's expansive. With the other hand, she removes fears and uncertainties we have towards abundance, including an ability to receive abundance. So she's a very householder goddess. So she teaches us to engage in the world and yet be spiritual. We're not ascetics. We're all here, you know, in beautiful Stratton. And the leg on the ground, she says, is be grounded. Don't quit your day job. Yeah? The leg up means you can be on the yogic path at the same time. So it's really an ability to straddle both spirituality and the worldly duties, you know. Very beautiful goddess. She's also the goddess of Shri, beauty. Everything you do becomes Shri. The way you talk, the way you do a yoga pose, you know how some people are naturally Shri, luminous. That's the meaning of Shri. That's what Lakshmi gives you. It can even be a menial job. I saw a sweeper clean the floor of a toilet once with Shri. So it's like embracing wholeheartedly in everything you do. That's the energy of Lakshmi. Okay? And her counterpart, goddess, is Saraswati. Very beautiful goddess. And there's an interesting story. So Saraswati is the goddess of knowledge, wisdom, music, creativity, and speech. Speech, very important for yoga teachers, and ability to articulate. And everything just flows out of you. That flow is important because Saraswati was the name of an ancient river in India around which the Vedic civilization was built, the Saraswati River. So there was a story, I remember uh, there was a Brahmin family many hundred years, years ago and the father was very erudite. He would understand all the Sanskrit, the Vedas and he was a great scholar and teacher in that area. 
but his son was very slow. He wouldn't understand Sanskrit and uh, wouldn't retain, wouldn't speak properly. And you know, many teachers who are new to yoga, Sanskrit, they have, you know, the same issue. And you know, it's understandable. You grow up in a different culture. Sanskrit is a foreign language. And it takes a while to get comfortable and starts to start speaking it fluently. And that's what Saraswati gives you. Anyway, this boy, the son, he had a good heart though. So once he went down to the river behind their house and he met a woman in distress. She was bleeding, she was hungry, poor, and he took pity on her. And he brought her home, he fed her, he clothed her, took good care of her and she was very grateful. So just before leaving, she did, just touched the tip of his tongue. And in that instant, a miracle happened. He started to speak fluently. He started to retain Sanskrit. And the Vedas made sense to him. And he became more and more knowledgeable. But not only knowledgeable, he was able to articulate it. And in one year, he surpasses his dad, becomes a great teacher. And that woman was Saraswati. Remember, he met her down near the river, the flow. So it, she represents the flow of intuition. What's intuition? Tuition within you. All the knowledge you want to know is within you. When you meditate in front of her, it flows. Not only flows, you are able to articulate it better. They say when you are speaking fluently in Sanskrit, or teaching yoga, philosophy, Saraswati dances at the tip of your tongue. So very beautiful goddess for learning, teaching, many musicians are drawn to her, creativity. So you look at her iconography, she has like a bead mala without beginning or end. And that is the enlightened state, something that is changeless, no birth or death, the circle. So she says the way to enlightenment is twofold. One is through the Vedas, that's the path of the mind. The other is through the heart. And the heart is what is prominent here. Because when the heart is open, wonderful things pour out. Okay? The head and the heart needs to be balanced. And in Kali Yuga, the age of darkness where greed, jealousy predominates, what's written in the Vedas is Harinama Kirtan. One has to chant. That's why Kirtan is taken off. That's what she recommends, the way of the heart. She is also all about creativity. The number 108 comes from Saraswati. She is responsible for the deep order in the universe. Okay, number 108 is not coincidental. Number of beads in a mala you are wearing is 108, correct? And the number 108 comes over and over. You know, you would chant 108 mantras. What this was mentioned 5,000 years ago by Saraswati in the Vedas. She is the Vedas come from her. She is Brahma Shakti. But what the astronomers found last century was distance of Earth to the Sun is 108 times the Sun's diameter. Distance of Earth to the Moon is 108 times the Moon's diameter. And the diameter of the Sun is 108 times the Earth's diameter. Pretty remarkable. Yeah, nothing is coincidental. Even the raindrops falling on the roof is not random. There's a deep order in the universe, comes from Saraswati. Furthermore, the, your breaths you take, the prana, an average inhalation, exhalation for anyone is four seconds of breath. And that's written in the yogic scriptures. And that's true, I, you know, I geek out on my plane rides, I measure my breath over 10 minutes, it averages to about four seconds. Inhalation, exhalation for everyone. So over a minute, we do it 15 times. Over an hour, it's times 60. Over a day, it's times 24. You do the math, it's 21,600. Now I see your eyes glazing over, but it's actually 108 times 200. So if you geek out enough, <laughs> yeah, you can count, do an equation which relates your prana to the breath you take to the diameter of the sun, the moon, and the earth. That's Hatha Yoga. Nothing is to chance. So there's a deep order in our solar system. The New York Times, I read an article, it said there are two new planets found with their own sun and moon. I bet you if the pattern of 108 is there, 
There's a good chance there's life. The prana right there. Nothing is by chance. Okay. Real quick, Hanuman is the ultimate archetype of bhakti, devotion, service. So in a nutshell, he represents superhuman strength, represents superhuman intelligence, but the main thing is he's all about service. It's a very rare combination, right? Somebody who's super strong and super smart, like a very smart NFL player, yeah? <laughs> but his main thing is he's very humble, loves to serve. Most people don't know he's an incarnation of Shiva and Shakti. There's a beautiful story about that, yeah? Interestingly, Pre President Obama's archetype is Hanuman. In the 2008 election, he carried a small murti, small statue of Hanuman in a pocket. If you Google Obama and Hanuman, you'll see the picture. Time magazine took a picture of his pocket, yeah? Because he represents service, and Obama was struck by the aspect of the service. From a Buddhist tradition, it's Tara. She's about service, compassion. So the metaphor for a spiritual path is like going up the mountain, retreating from society, that's what Lord Buddha did. The word Buddha means the awakened one. The buddhi, the intellect, got awakened. It is really the intellect within us that is closest to consciousness. That's why yesterday was the longest day of the year, and one has to chant the Gayatri Mantra. Om Bhur Bhuvasuvaha. Tatsavitur Varenyam Bhargo Devasya Dhimahi Dhiyo Yona Prachodaya. The Dhi is the buddhi, intellect. And yesterday was the longest day of the year, the sun was the most. What this mantra says is the light of all lights, the lights of consciousness. Let it illuminate your buddhi, your intellect. That's why the name Buddha means his intellect awakened. Okay? So Tara is the feminine aspect of Buddha. She de descends down the mountain into the world of chaos to help people. You cannot teach people spirituality if they are hurting physically or mentally. So she's a great healer. And then she leads people to awakening. So I think I gave you a bit of a taste. You know, I come from San Diego. There's a lot of beautiful beaches. It's like being near a beach. There's a lot of good negative ions, you feel good. And we took a swim today. But I encourage you to go deeper in the study of Vedanta. That's really the joys. So I really want to thank you, you guys have been so sweet. Thank you so much.